Like we are right on the precipice of a pole new way of thinking about success. So Foundation for Young Australians, which is like the largest foundation that invests in thinking about young people and what's happening for them now, but also in the future. Thousands of students, um, after paying back the $20, which was the $20 boss loan, then went on to make profit, which they always donated to their school or their community. Entrepreneurship is actually a muscle that you just need to um, practice and hone. I mean, Bitcoin's going to become a solution for lots of things, right? And not having to go through central agencies or all of those things is very, very, very powerful. Going back to the, the $20 boss idea, I think that would be such a cool project to do specifically with BTC. I'm gonna have to add to my currencies of life. I'm gonna have to say, you know, love, power and Bitcoin. Alrighty, welcome to Get Off Zero. Um, we've got a very special guest today. Um, but before we jump in, if you can jump onto getoffzeropod.com and um, there's the there's a whole bunch of links there, but I've put up some new links for people to check out. So the Spotify links and the Fountain app, so you can actually listen to this live on the Lightning Network, which is really cool. Um, so Jan Owens, our guest today, and she is an awesome lady that I've known for years. And I feel like we're always kind of like ships in the night at conferences, uh, like like I am with so many people, but we're always kind of like, oh, awesome, we'll have to catch up soon. And we never get a chance to sit down and chat properly. So I was more excited just to hang out with you and have a chat today <laughs> than do a podcast. So I'm super excited. But um. Yeah, tell us a bit about yourself, Jan, if you can, and your background with FYA and what you're working on now and all the cool stuff that you've been doing and, and doing at the moment, if you could. Hi, Kieran. Thank you. Um, well, I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people in Boonarong Nations, uh, of the Kulin Nation in uh, Melbourne. And... Um, yeah, we have had, there's been a lot going on, isn't there? There's been a huge amount going on, particularly in education and learning. So I've been, over the last few years, um, since I left Foundation for Young Australians, where we did, I guess, some of that really seminal work on what the future of work of, for young people might look like, but also that took us back to education, of course, as it always does. Um, so how might we prepare young people for a really different and rapidly changing world? Um, and then since then, I've had this fantastic opportunity just to work with a bunch of different organisations, one being Learning Creates Australia that we set up inside FIA, the Foundation for Human Australians, and then have kind of taken out, um, looking at what does success genuinely mean in education learning? And if you didn't have the kind of high stakes testing or the, what I call the cliff, um, what would you have instead? What, what would you put in place for students that would really tell us and tell them what they know and can do? Oh, and how that they sounds might represent themselves sort of in the world better. Yeah. Uh, so, so is that is that them uh, sort of rating themselves and, and grading themselves? Is that the idea rather than? Well, a bunch of different modalities, but part of it is definitely self-assessment. Um, but part of it is also through doing, you know, inquiry-based learning projects or any other numbers of ways of presenting your learning. Um, there's different ways of then assessing that, obviously, because if you're not just doing high stakes tests as your only way of assessing what some people know, then there's lots of ways that you can present yourself. And there's then great ways to assess that. I guess the, the challenge, and this is the design challenge that we're working into now and really leaning into is that how do you ensure that that is whatever that new way of assessing and recognizing and validating and verifying what young people know and can do is sort of equitable so that you can't kind of game the system because you have some special extra superpower or access to some body or some system um, that enables you to, to kind of um, inequitably get ahead of someone else. So that's mm. the challenge and the design question, but it's brilliant and I feel incredibly pleased that in a very short time, and I think this is one of the great outcomes of COVID, Kieran, is that we've been able to get to this place. Like we mm -hmm. are right on the precipice of a, of a kind of a whole 
new way of thinking about success and how we demonstrate success. In Absolutely, and, and new new learning as well. Obviously, like I think I think the for all the negatives from the lockdowns and the and COVID and everything, I think the positive is stuff like this, right? Like it's it's just yeah. natural now to be doing Zooms every day. Um, students are used to it. Like I ran a class this morning, like with, with students mm. in uh, at Chisholm. Um, it was really cool, actually. Like cybersecurity grads going through a Bitcoin class. I was like, I was in my element. But um, yeah, like we did. I didn't have to leave the house to do that, and that would have been kind of weird before COVID. So I think you you're totally right with that. And I think in terms of like metrics and. Um, yeah, sort of self-reviewing as well. I think that's changed as well. I think, like, obviously, I think there there is the the negatives. Like, there is people sort of afraid to leave their house now, and all that sort of stuff. But I think maybe the good kind of out, outweighs the bad a little bit. Like, in terms of of um, progression towards a smaller world, really. Because, like, even doing podcasting, you can just chat to people on the other side of the world as long as you get your times right. My big um, frustration at the moment has been uh daylight saving time i think we need to mm. abolish that <laughs> doesn't it just and doesn't yeah. it kill you because everybody goes in it together so one minute you're like yes i'm really happy to talk to you at your 6 p.m and my 9 a.m or the other way around yep. and then daylight saving comes and suddenly it's like no there's only midnight or 3 a.m yeah how does that yep. happen so like how does uh. the whole thing turn upside down so quickly around the world it's so bizarre it's nuts but yeah daylight saving is very tricky it's a there's killer no doubt. i think we there's need no just doubt. one internet time and that's it one internet time <laughs> so it's just if it's four o'clock it's four o'clock wherever it is in the world that's, and that's so it. great one really internet time <laughs> um, I love that. <laughs> so just just to rewind a little bit if we could um just going into FYA, because people listening to this might not know what that is. There's people mm. were actually the, looking at the metrics, the majority of listeners that I've had for this podcast and the previous one have been from Argentina. I don't know why, oh. but yeah, yeah, that's where they're... Hello, Argentina. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's so cool. It's awesome. Um, so cool. Yeah, they might not know what like the, the New Work Order mm. report was or FYA. Mm. Could you get into that? Because I think it's really important. Yeah. So... Um... We were thinking in, so Foundation for Young Australians, which is like the kind of largest foundation that really um, sort of invests in thinking about, um, definitely about sort of young people and what's happening for them now, but also we decided to focus really on the future. And we did that in sort of two ways. One was backing young people, so had um, a very large program supporting young social entrepreneurs which we called young social pioneers so they were kind of 18 to 28 year olds with great ideas to how to change the world and kind of social change agents um, and then a very big program like 60,000 students um, in schools doing entrepreneurship and there was a very big challenge which you know about Kieran called $20 Boss which um, was huge and lots of students got into this program where you got $20 for one ter school term and in that term you had to set up a business for people profit purpose planet um, and you did that in teams. There was always a hustler, a, a hacker, and a what's the third one? <laughs> hustler, hacker, and um, whatever the other one was. The tech, the tech, the tech. No, that was Technical. the hacker. No, that'll be the hacker. Yeah. Anyway, hustler, hacker, and something else. And then they were always business in man, teams. business person, yeah, the maybe. business, yeah. yeah, somebody there. But it was started with H, which I've now literally has left me. And in those teams, that we saw the most remarkable results because these were like 12 to 15, 16 year olds. And they would, number one, they would always fall really quickly into what sort of their their propensity or their sort of in, intense interest was. They always, always, always created something that would be of benefit for their own lived situation and their community and their school and other young people. Um, they were very, very diverse in the sort of um, businesses that they set up. 99% of the students paid back the $20. Thousands and thousands and thousands of students um, 
after paying back the $20, which was the $20 boss loan, then went on to make profit, which they always donated to their school or their community. Brilliant. So we just saw the most ridiculous trend lines in how young people getting these skills of entrepreneurship, but linked to sort of purpose and planet and profit um, was so such a powerful model. So FIA really was very focused on that kind of entrepreneurial. And then we did a lot of research, which is what was the future of work or the new work order research on, okay, what's coming? What might young people be facing and how can we make sure that we prepare and equip them adequately? Uh, and so there was a series of five, six or seven reports over um, about that same period of time for six years. Um, where we mapped out in kind of real detail, used big data analytics that hadn't been tracked before, like um, looked at, you know, 4.6 million job advertisements to find out what skills employers were asking for of new graduates, um, looked at 12 million jobs across Australia to see not what the job titles were, but what the skill and capability types that were being sought by employers and started to bring kind of the demand and the supply side together for the first time and have this sort of conversation. So what is demanding out there in that, in that entire world of work? And then what's, what, do, what do students need to be doing? And therefore, what should schools and educators be doing um, as well to help students? So those reports had about a 50 million reach. They got picked up by the OECD, the World Economic Forum. Um, and in fact, in Argentina, there were definitely people who were downloading those reports. So all yes. over the world, there were people using these reports to, um, and that was our idea. Our idea was, Yes, there were some policy shifts we wanted to see and we were definitely lobbying and advocating, but we also wanted to get information directly into the hands of students, parents and educators. Yeah, so, so cool. I think the, the, the metrics that came out of that were just so fascinating to see like where the trends are going and no one else was doing it like anywhere in the world. Mm. So it's like, it's still referenced a lot today. What year was that? That was like 20... We started in 2015. Yeah, we yeah. put out a report actually that was about, you know, why we needed to invest in young people. You know, Australia's this aging population and unless we ensured that our tax base was short up, um, you know, we would be in real trouble. You know, we would never be able to pay the health bills that were coming. And, um, and also, you know, we've spent many decades, as everyone knows, in Australia at least that we extract in extraction, extraction of resources out of the ground and selling them to anyone who'll buy them. Um, and we all, everyone could see that that was coming to an end and that our actual best asset would be our people and our knowledge. And that means particularly a massive investment in children and young people. So mm. that, you know, as, as the future kind of knowledge center of a country that needed to shift from, you know, we have previous to that, we had this fantastic term, which was we um, thrived off the sheep's back. Uh, and then we went into resources and mining, um, which isn't going anywhere. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of mining and certainly in renewables, there's still a lot of um, natural resources we have in Australia. But I think this emphasis towards that would, the, the next iteration, the 21st century would be definitely about our know-how and our smarts, you mm -hmm. know, and that was very important. Green mining, I think that's that's something that's really important to that's me as well. So yeah, specifically Bitcoin green mining. So like the the there's a really cool uh, there's a bunch of cool stories around that. But my favorite actually is from El Salvador. So I don't know if you've been following what's going on there with them um, basically making Bitcoin legal tender. Um, mm. It's I've got some friends there actually this week. I was meant to go over there, but I've I've had too much on. But um, yeah. it's a big big conference on and. Basically, what the the president's done is created universal basic income mm. for everybody yeah. there, yeah. and he's doing it through Bitcoin miners powered by a volcano. <laughs> it's incredible. So he's doing universal what? basic income, yeah, over proof of work powered by a volcano. So completely green. It's all um, self-contained by this like thermal energy from this 
Um, wow. This, this, this amazing volcano. They're going up to visit it, so I'm so, so jealous. I'm, I'm really, really keen to get over yeah. there and check it all out. But that's like that, <laughs> that, that, that's the future, right? So, like, the, the amazing. we have these natural resources, so he's harnessing mm. that to, to help his – and it's, it's – you see that GDP, it's just gone like that yeah. since. And there's, like, listening to people living there. I've, I've interviewed people um, living there as well. Actually, one of the people from Amber's moved over the – um, but wow. the, the violent streets people used to go down now are walking around with mobile phones. Like it's not a big deal. And this is in the space of like a year and it wow. all started, you, you'd probably appreciate it more than, than anyone. It started with some educators that actually went in from, uh, the States. They, they, they went down and wanted to create a circular economy. So they literally just paid students to stay in school rather than join a gang. So wow. they did it at one school. It's called Bitcoin Beach. Mm. Did it at one school, paid these students, and then upskilled them, leapfrogged any other um, like computers or yeah. internet connectivity. Yeah. So it's all just mobile phones, so smartphones, yeah. using software from Australia called Ball of Satoshi for the most part. So that's that's the Lightning Network. Set up all the the vendors to accept Bitcoin, and then started this circular wow. economy. And then the weirdest thing happened, like all these um, like gangsters from these gangs, because they all have siblings, were like, uh, can you do this at this school and this school? And it kind of went up this wow. the, the, the coast, all these schools. So we got to the president, and now the whole country is like on its way up. Um, wow. It's going to be sucks. like a Bitcoin-educated country. <laughs> it is, it is. And they're, they're doing the – I think they've got the first uh, accredited course as well that you can actually do, which I'm – I'm trying to do that in Australia as well. So I'm trying to teach myself really? Really? Um, how to do a accredited course for them, which is cool. Um, it kind of sucks that I think like it has to be a third world country that it gets is like a pain point before we can you know mm. onboard people. Mm. Um, mm. But so many cool stories. And another one is actually out of um, Central Africa, and this this is one that's just incredible. So they've had um, a big influx of BTC use there. Mm -hmm. And it's same software, actually. So there's all videos of this Australian software, it's Wallet of Satoshi being used wow. there. Um, but they did an experiment. I really want to um, get, a, get a hold of Sagata Mitra to tell him this story because I reckon he would love it. Basically, a group of kids, 10 to 12 years old, they gave them all like a, a, a paycheck, a similar sort of thing. They paid them and created yeah. a circular economy and said, you guys can buy whatever you want. And we're just yeah. going to keep paying you up. So it's not for yeah. doing anything. It's, this is just yeah. your money. Yeah. <laughs> so they've done that. And then as kids would do, they went and bought lollies and nonsense for a couple of weeks. <laughs> and then they were going to intervene. They thought, no, nah, we'll just see see what happens. So they documented the whole thing. About three weeks goes past, four weeks goes past, about a month goes past. And then they start buying healthy food. And then they start buying you know, things that you would need to for your family, that sort of thing. Yeah. Another couple of weeks go past and they, the kids on their own figured out, oh, if we pull our, our Bitcoin together, pull our resources together, we can buy in bulk and then we can save more money between us. Yes. They did that on their own. Now, yes. I don't know about you, but most Australian kids <laughs> do not save money. They spend, right? But yeah. these, these kids learn that on their own just through the power of the network. So it's, it's amazing, amazing what's happening. But you know like, why I love that story? Because it, it, it does feel like the next generation of $20 boss because all yes. those behaviours were really present there, like unexpected behaviours, like they did save their money. Like kids would save the tw – they would go and pick stuff off the side of the street and save their $20 till right at the end and then sell what they'd recycled or upcycled from all the stuff they found in their suburb at the market like at the biggest market day in their suburb and save the $20 right, right, right to the end to go and get that stall. That's you know, right. it's exactly that. It's very, very clever, smart. And they would have done exactly the same with Bitcoin, I reckon. In fact, that would yeah. be, if that was still running that program, which it's not, that's what should be. <laughs> Absolutely. Be Absolutely. Well, we did, did a mini version of that at Warana. Um, so the $20 oh, yeah, boss cool. we, we did with Satoshi's and yeah. the kids. Yeah, uh, great. 
great, did great, their own, great. own projects. A little bit harder with primary school kids, but they did some cool yeah. stuff like web development. Um, in the end, I don't think anyone gave any Bitcoin back. <laughs> it was basically just, <laughs> yeah, have yeah. something and, and start a business. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but no, it's still like the, the premise is, was It's really, still the really same. Cool. It's the same it kind is. of premise. It's amazing. It's really good. And the, uh, the other thing is that what we know about which is why it's so good and so essential to do this stuff very early because the fear factor is very minimal in children mm. and the fail yes. fast propensity yep. is very high. So yep. this is why we always said, you know, entrepreneurship is actually a muscle that you just need to um, practice and hone and kind of get and build strength in it. And so whatever it is, however many times you fail, it's fine, it's $20, it doesn't matter. You know, that whole idea um, is so powerful and it must be done with children. Like it's just so much easier. <laughs> and the... It is, it is. And new concepts are easier as well. Like, like you're saying, like they're not afraid to learn new stuff. Whereas sort of people older, have got preconceptions about the world and how things work and yet it is a lot harder. So yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. But bang on. So, um, moving along that, I mean that your work with that is just amazing. And I think there's so many people that have benefited from that and, and continue to. So it's a great, it's a really cool open source template for, for people to follow along. I'll put the, mm. the notes show note in the show notes, a link to everything so that people can read. Um, so, it was a little while ago, God, was, when was the last time I saw you? I think it was at Peter Hutton's event, and we yeah. were, it was it was the yeah. fundraiser future for the future schools, yeah, for the future school, yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us a, a bit about the the future school project and sort of how that came about, and um, yeah, where where it's at now? So, future schools is um, a project which is again all about how might we do school differently and what would happen if in the 21st century when we all have agency in our lives and you just gave 20 examples Karen <laughs> Pastor, we're, we're walking around with computers that are at the highest you know level that you can get in your hand at the moment you know every kid can have them there's one-year-olds walking around with iPads, you know, playing more than babe, listening to Baby Shark. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. So we are just extensions, and this or this technology is extension of us. So, you know, we, it does make you, it does cause you to think, what the hell is school for? And so the whole idea of future school was like, what the hell is school for? Um, and what, how could it be? done differently. Yes, the learning, which I've just talked about before. So how might you measure success in learning? What are the 20 different million ways that you can learn today? How does technology enhance that, complement that? So yeah, all that's going on and that's why we have ed tech conferences, etc. But another part of it was in place. Um, what could you do differently? And so the future school idea was very much about put the learner at the center and their own self-created learning journey, which of course is also mapped to what they need to be learning from a kind of a, a system point of view and in whatever country that you're in. But how do you center the learner and create the journey that's personalized around them? And so future schools was really about us doing that and using um, infrastructure differently, using the built environment differently, seeing school as actually every single building in your city, every single building in your suburb, not just some that have got school written on the outside, um, utilizing workplaces and work environments um, in a very, very different way to blend and create just these very porous boundaries between what is so called school and that kind of captive time of your life, which is 13 years in Australia, mostly yeah. for most people. But how do you transform that to be, um, that's a part of my life where I was learning in this particular different way in this particular context, but it was not completely um, alien to every other part of my life, whether what I was doing out of school in the garage with my garage band or what I was doing with my market or what I was doing with my Bitcoin on the weekend or what I was doing with my drone, that these things were not separate to another life and a, and a kind of alien life. So that's what the Future Schools experiment is. And we've just moved to um, uh, start to look at a couple of sites where we might 
um, that have got that have really lend themselves to being kind of these more open source sites in communities and then online. We have some quite radical ideas that we want to test, Karen, like schools open 24 seven. Um, so you can go to school at Love any that. time of the day or night um, and there will be somebody there. So to cut you off with that one, is that I was on a, I forget what TV show it was, up in Sydney, um, panel discussion one. Anyway, I was on with some kids and it was like a short clip um, that's been taken out of context a bunch of times online. Really? Where I say, oh, we've got a 24 seven learning space. It's fantastic in Minecraft. And all these people have taken that to mean that the kids are on their screens 24-7. It's like, no, 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 (laughs) you've got access to learning 24-7. They don't care. So I love love that. I love that there's a physical space for that. Yes, yes, exactly. And also a digital space, right? So same, same. Mm -hmm. So, um, So that obviously, you know, things that you know a lot about and lots of people listening, I guess, like self-paced learning, which is definitely the new way of learning. And then um, I think we wanted to kind of, again, do this blend of don't wait to some magical moment where you go and again, engage in um, your passions and interests in kind of the real world and, and in the real world of work. Again, how do you make that just much more blended so that you don't get future shock when you leave school or you don't sort of also have to think that these things are blocks of time. Like I did a block of time in primary and I did a block of time in high school and then I did a block of time in further education and then I went to work. Like that is just such a crazy waste of time and crazy use it's of gross. time. gross. It's yeah. <laughs> just, it's, it is, it's actually shocking. Yeah. Um, so there's, we're trying to solve for that. And really what we're trying to do, Karen, I think is come up with kind of a demonstration project yeah. that really yeah. would, could be replicated in other places and, and also showcase to the education system and learning system that here's a way that you could do this, this really differently. And we've got examples of that in Australia and lots around the world, but I would still call them points of light rather than Mm -hmm. the norm and I think we need to get to that tipping point where there's a lot of points of light that then become the norm and the system moves as a result it is you're right and there's so many parents and and students hungry for a a, dare I say critical thinking system yeah (laughs) but like But like, it's something where you're not sitting in a room for, you know, eight hours or six hours a day with someone with, you know, in in a lot of countries, it is eight eight hours a day with someone at the front of the room and sitting in row. like those days are gone. That's not how people learn anymore. Like I got an email this morning from a parent in, uh, in Egypt who saw a video of, uh, myself and Seth, who was one of the students from Rana, um, on what was it cna which is like the the asian news network and uh it was about like his his learning journey and and you know their move from singapore to our school and everything and um she was like oh do you do tutoring i'm like like, how how did you find me (laughs) so she's gone out of her way like to find a different system so you're right if we could have an organization and a a physical building i still think a physical building is really important um as a template, like an open source template yeah. for other people to copy, I think that that it would be magic. Yeah. So, so what what do you see as like the what's what's sort of stopping it from happening like today? Like what what's what's it what's in in the way of the roadmap? Would you say? Um, that's a really well. I'd love to hear what you think about that. I think what's stopping <laughs> it. I think what has been stopping it is this perception that about what school is that. Um, it's this place where you go and, you know, your head gets opened, peeled back and knowledge gets dumped in and then yeah. you have this knowledge and then you go out in the world. That's one stream of thinking. The other stream of thinking is that schools are a place where you kind of learn all these sort of social skills but nobody's really clear what they are and and then when they're when those social skills are disrupted with, you know, massive mental health crises or issues, nobody knows what to do anyway. So all of the all of the kind of... And of course, that knowledge piece is rubbish because you just go onto Google and find out anything that you need. You can also get Google now to write any essay that you could want about anything in the world. So obviously, that's another reason that high stakes testing just becomes 
a crazy idea. So I think all these ideas that we've had, which 100% served us, I'm not saying that. They served us in the past, but because mm-hmm. we didn't move, Kieran, when we could have, and I would say particularly at the, even, even 20 two years ago, even the beginning of the 20th century, let's be kind. Even 22 yep. years ago, we didn't move. Now we actually have a system that's broken and in crisis. If we had yep. moved back in 1999 even, and by the way, people were calling on this stuff way before then, but even 22 years ago, because think how much the world has changed in that time, how incredible yep. it would have been to have an education system that was in step with that change. But in fact, we've still got a 20th century education system. factory model yeah 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 100 would would you say it's uh in victoria i know there's a lot of compliance do you think that kind of gets in the way of of creating like a, a new school such as this well you know what do you think about compliance i always think of compliance as two things number one it's a risk management strategy <laughs> firstly yeah. and foremost yeah. um, because if we find out that for instance we could assess and measure and validate and verify student success really really differently but it would take a different kind of approach and then you'd have to um, relax some of your compliance or you'd have to at least revisit it you know that's a big risk mm-hmm. and so there is a that compliance is about risk management as much as anything, it's not actually about equity. Because, And the reason I can say that is that the system is inequitable. We've got the fourth most inequitable system in the world. We're one of the few countries in the world left with a kind of an ATAR system that ranks you as you leave school, like a league table. I mean, so we are genuinely out of step in Australia, at least now, compared to other parts of the world. So yeah. What does that tell you? I've always wondered, like, who came up with that idea to rank children and put a number on their head. <laughs> like, <laughs> what Nazi came up with that crazy idea? Like, it's horrendous. Well, like, it, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help anybody. All it does is make, is divide. It's very divisive. And it also is very debilitating to to young people you know i was one of those kids because i was very entrepreneurial and a kind of autodidact and i have one of my children is like that so i saw an intergenerational play of this which is very disturbing um and so (laughs) i failed at everything at school like literally i mean i didn't fail at everything i failed at lots and lots and lots of things and i particularly failed at that last hurdle which was the atar um as did my son Um, And I have to say, you know, thank goodness I could say to him, and nobody said this to me, by the way, so I had to, you know, be in therapy for the next hundred years. But (laughs) he, I could say to him, Alex, you have not failed the education system. The education system has failed you. Failed you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that was a game changer. And he has been fine, a hundred percent fine because he really understood that at a really kind of existential level. That's brilliant. That's really brilliant. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's, and and what a good mum, really. (laughs) Like how many, how many mums are out there doing that? Like who have no idea. They just think, oh, this metric means something. Yeah. And my kids know, my kids are no good. Oh my kids, you know, like, and they've they've now done all that. And the other thing is we've done, we've done it all now, right? We've now, we've now looked at all the data. Basically, most people who go to university, half of them don't go with an ATAR now, number one. Number two, those with the highest ATARs actually struggle the most at university. So, you know, on and on and on. Now the data is pouring out that validates this. But we still have this mindset because we are creatures that are fixated on the kind of mindsets that we have been given from a very, very, very young age. And unless we genuinely disrupt those neural pathways, it's very hard to get new ideas in there. But we've had this mindset for many, 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 many decades in this country about that particular ranking and that particular um, idea. And that, you know, somebody even said as as late as this week um, that, you know, TAFE, which is our tertiary and vocational education, which of course is highly regarded in countries all through Europe. And in fact, you would go to vocational education before you would go to university. So it's a highly Mm -hmm. regarded pathway. In this country, it's still said 
there for the lost cause kids. That was actually yeah. said at a conference like two days ago. Whoa, are you kidding me? God, do you want to out who said that? <laughs> no, because it's a held oh, view. Man. It's a widely held yeah. view. That's gross. Oh mm. my goodness. Well, we've got to change that as well. Mm. I think like, so we, we had like students, like cybersecurity grads working with us doing placement at my school. Yeah. They were wonderful yeah. and like really switched on. And to like, I, I did both. So I, I did, uh, I did the first cybersecurity class in Australia. Amazing. Um, Cause it was available at TAFE years ago and it was fantastic. And then I went on to uni and I would rate the the cybersecurity class at TAFE like way higher because it was hands on there wasn't that many people doing yes. it and like the the learning out of it was like real world so like they even did like mock um, interviews like set up so we each had like our own um, persona so like mm. I was in charge of yeah. Wi Fi so I had to do Wi Fi security and I had to know everything about that and then we had, each had to like build a network for that. Um, and then physically do it. So then build this network and then one side of the, the class ha had to hack that network and the other side had to build yeah, it. was amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. So, <laughs> so yeah, to hear that, hear that's just awful. Awful. <laughs> it's absolutely shocking, like really oh. terrible and sort of evil. Like it is kind of evil. Like, and not to say, like I went to Swinburne, it was fantastic and we did hands-on stuff as well, but yeah. I would rate. The Swinburne like, is the hands-on, one of the hands-on places, so that helps. Um, it does. Yeah, it does yeah, for yeah. sure. But but going back to the future school. So like I I, I love the idea. I don't know. Uh, Peter Hutton did an amazing presentation mm. using Lego. I've still got my Lego block here actually. Good. <laughs> um, That's what you love. Which I thought was really cool. But what what sort of struck me, um, and I had had a chat to him briefly on the night about it. And I know he's he's got his new school now, so he's working like mm. seven days a week. <laughs> yeah. Sounds of it. Yeah. That, that crazy man. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like he's loving it. So it's it's an important thing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the funding aspect to things, and this will probably mm. bring it back to, to BTC, but I think like the, do you think that's, that's a big hurdle for a lot of these, um, cause a lot of people have a lot of cool ideas to mm. do, yeah. um, to build new institutions, build yeah. new schools. Like we, we were lucky enough to get some funding for, for our school to build that steam center that we built. Um, but it was just randomly. Uh, through a, a philanthropist coming from America who donated Bitcoin to our school. Do you think that might be a big hurdle for, for programs like that? And mm. yeah, could you see Bitcoin as a solution? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I mean, I mean, Bitcoin's going to become a solution for lots of things, right? It's just how mm -hmm. and in what, um, what are the use cases? I think that's what people are still really waiting to see because it's been so volatile. <laughs> people are kind of wanting and they just see it as like a trade right it's just people yeah people trading Australia, you know yeah, they're very yeah. much so in Australia it's like oh there's people yeah. trading and it's all yeah whatever um but and also there's been a lot of losses and gains early from the early adopters so it's all you know it's a very obviously it's a still I would say it's still an emerging space you might think differently to that that it's very kind of well there's, there's one there's one thing I'll interject with there and it's the the price is kind of meaningless mm. so there's something called hash rate and the hash rate of the network is the power of the network we've gone into this this morning actually and um i'll i'll uh, I'll, I'll post a a, uh, a link to the current chart today but basically you have the the price overlapped that's doing this going down and the hash rate is at an all-time high today like mm. this so something doesn't add up mm. right so like what why would you put so much energy into something that has a, a low price? Mm. There's that the issue, and you're probably seeing like with FTX yeah. and, and these centralized exchanges, yeah. it's manipulation of the price. Yeah. So that's why it's, it's not worth looking at that at all. Mm. What's important is this decentralized network yeah. that's never been hacked and never gone down. Mm. We've never built anything like that before no. in history. No. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, in some regard, even better than the internet in mm. terms of the power and what it can do mm. with that. So it's a single source of truth mm. that we've never had before. Yeah. And it's, it's really incredible. Yeah, so, I agree. I mean, and the fact that it's decentralized, I mean, I, I, I don't know what it means for Australia and you need to tell me this, but I can a hundred percent see how in particular other particular markets, um, 
and for instance across you know anywhere where you want to really really verify sort of and trust the the process of exchange and the kind of decentralization of it and it not having to go through central agencies or all of those things is very 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 powerful um mm -hmm. in a country like australia where we have a and so that's very good for us in terms of global markets obviously um, but what do you see as the application for, say, Australia, where we do have kind of, you know, trusted and verified systems of exchange? Yeah, if you can call them that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, look, I think there's, it's it's interesting because you, you look at the exchanges here and I've, I've noticed like they're actually using metrics to block transactions, mm. which is really gross. So you can't really trust them. So, mm. so there's a, there's a lot of exchanges out there that want to sort of keep your, your money, if you want to call it that, or, or your, I like to think of it as energy transfer mm. on, on their system and basically give you an IOU. Mm. And that's, that's what's happening kind of across the board. Um, there is stuff called like proof of, um, what do they call it? Proof of reserves, POR, mm. Mm. which is interesting, I suppose. But I think that it kind of, I think exchanges are like a weak point. We don't mm. need them. Mm. All we need is education and enough people upskilled to be their own bank. Mm. Unfortunately, like I was saying before, it kind of has to hit that pain point where people realize it. So mm. whether that's, you know, inflation, you probably notice a, a yeah. lot of stuff going up in, yeah. in price mm. recently here. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a solution to that in the, in the long term. But I think more so security. Mm. So like you have this this network that hasn't been hacked. Like if you if you look at the Optus hack, the mm. Medicare hack, like all these things that just keep happening over and over again in Australia, they're mostly social engineering. So they're mostly just just weak uh, networks that probably shouldn't have the data they have in the first place. If we can get enough people upskilled to to own their own data and be their own bank, mm. and I think Bitcoin's sort of the jump off point mm. for that. Mm, but more specifically, I was, that's really good. Yeah, well, I, th I think I think there is is a, there's a lot to to that aspect and how we um, help people in Australia. There's a lot of people destitute in Australia now as well that could benefit from this type of education and even being an entrepreneur it means you can you can interact with anyone mm, all over yeah, the world, exactly. uh, not just in Australia. Sort yeah. of thing. So I think there's that aspect to it. Yeah. But in terms of yeah, like uh, funding things. It, it, do you think there would be, because uh, uh, I mean, there'll probably be a lot of Bitcoiners listening to this who think, <laughs> yeah. wow, that's that's a cool, that's a really cool idea for a school. Um, I'd like to, to help something like that. I know there's been a few projects around the world that they, they've done. Mm. Do you think that's something that we, we could pursue with, with the future school? Is that, I, I, I'd be very interested in that. Have you got examples of that in other parts of the world where schools have been funded? Funded, yeah, yeah really? for sure. Well, I mean, like, yeah, well, in Australia, so ours, for example, but <laughs> now there, there has been like, so there's universities as well, uh, in the States, there's one in, I know there's one in Greece accepting tuition fees. That's the one that donated to us really? in the first place. Really? Um, one in the UK. So I think Cambridge actually was doing BTC as well. Um, but there's been, yeah, there's been education spaces funded and I know like a lot of third world spaces as well. So Bitcoin Beach is all the, the schools funded with that. There's schools in Africa, like I mentioned before. So mm. there's a bunch, but mm. there's a lot, lot of documentation that you could look at with that. Mm. And I, what I, what I really want to do is find out more about what's happening with the students. Yeah. Like so that yeah. that anecdote about the the kids, um, yeah, learning how to yeah. save yeah. together on their own. I think yeah. it's it really reminds me of the the school in the cloud and the the kids in India. Yeah, yeah, like that's right. Creating their own school. That's like, right. Oh, so so cool yeah i think but, you're um, right i think there's one which is like you know fund the school the the other is like yeah underwrite this sort of whole entrepreneurship kind of movement of students around the world and let them start working with each other because that i mean genuinely yeah. one of the things that that will accelerate the kind of really getting to the wicked problems that we need to get to is going to be how we have this kind of global view, right? So we, we understand that there are very, very pressing, you know, global issues and they're very real for all of us in all our contexts now. 
Um, and so you have to have the ability to act locally. And so this sort of global view is something that I think is very, very, very powerful and particularly for students. It's the only way that we're gonna deal with this kind of existential um, anxiety that students have at the moment, which is, um, you know, manifesting itself in mental health issues and yeah, and just general anxiety is the way to get beyond that is to give people agency and opportunities to do things. And one of the things that I'm very, very interested in is because um, we're all looking at micro credentials now. So how do you micro credential, you know, people's learning as they go? So learning in the flow of kind of life and work. Um, and so big platforms that are helping people do that globally so that again you can compare and contrast skills and capabilities in a much more seamless way and I'm very interested in how Bitcoin might um, accelerate that flow of learning around the world and and particularly to ensure that you know, lots and millions and millions and millions of more students and young people get access to that. You know, just the fact that there are 1.9 billion, um, you know, students that aren't back in school post COVID, you know, is a really, mm -hmm. really, really serious issue. So again, we're gonna have to think very quickly about how do those students get learning in a very um, different environment and a very different way. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, in, in, uh, in my course, there's, um one of the one of the parents who kids refusing to go so he's 12 yeah. so it's been six months mm. i think at home so i'm actually doing up an old laptop that i've got to to get him onto code academy because he's like just sitting at home like yeah. not, not doing anything I'm like geez that's that's really hard and she's got to work and and she's you know studying her tae so she can she can teach as well mm. but um yeah it's really rough and i think there's a lot of kids out there like that so you're right if we could yeah, implement a system for that. So there's actually another program I'm working on called the School of Bitcoin. So we check out the school of Bitcoin.com. We've got a whole bunch of links and stuff on there. Right. Um, but basically there's well, it's twofold, I suppose. So we're looking at <clears throat> creating a marketplace. Mm. Um, actually, there's a, there's a company called uh, Open Course. That's a, it's a startup, but it's, it's really incredible. So we're looking at partnering with them to build out it's essentially think Spotify for education. Mm, yeah. So, you know, Spotify, you can like yeah. curate yeah. your lists of yeah. whatever it is, yeah. Um, music. Yeah. But we want to do that for courses. So MOOCs, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, materials, yeah. like all of it and make really clear learning pathways yeah. for specific yeah. things. Yeah. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll take each aspect of mm. BTC and like whether that's security mm. or lightning or whatever it mm. is, because um, it's for the most part, that all that information sort of disjointed, like hence me wanting to try and write an accredited course yes, for it. Yes, so yes, yes. And bring it all yes, together. Yes, exactly. But it's stuff that's like all out there and you mm. want to go, here, like where do you, yeah, where do you send yeah, people? Yeah. So, and curation so is I, like what everybody needs more than anything yes. in the world right now is really, really, really excellent curation of, exactly. of what they need to know about, yeah. Exactly. So with, with open course, we can, um, curate stuff mm. and then people can, you know, star rate it, upvote it. Fantastic. Um, what I want to do with it is integrate the lightning network so that the curators actually get paid in Bitcoin for their work mm. as well. So on top brilliant. of that, so that, that's one aspect. Yeah. That's brilliant. the other aspect. The other thing we're working on with the score Bitcoin is, um, something called something we're calling a days, which is a bit, it's a bit of a wacky, wacky <laughs> idea that I came up with. Yeah. Um, so it's a decentralized autonomous education system. So the idea is you have a, a only one didactic thing in the program and that's financial literacy, uh, because none of us are financially literate. No one bothered to teach us in school. Yeah. Don't even tell you what money is, where it comes from, nothing. And it's mm -hmm. like, off you go and go, <laughs> go and find a job. Yeah. For what reason? Oh, to find money? Okay, cool. No one told me what it is. So that's the only thing and getting as close to truth as possible mm. in that. So that everyone gets a chance to upvote that mm. and it's all open source. We can all, all run through that. Mm, mm, then mm. from there, hopefully you're financially literate. And then we've got, uh, we've got a stacking pool for BTC. It's like a fund to actually fund learner projects. So no teachers, no students, oh. only learners because we're all, we're all learners, right? We're all learners, exactly. 
So the, the wow. once you're financially literate, you get a NFT certification. Yeah. NFT certification can be used to either upgrade the curriculum. So if you think it's all crap, that's awesome. Fix it, and then you can <laughs> you can own a piece of it as well. Wow. Um, or if if you think it's great, then you can apply to do uh, project based learning or problem based learning, as like we, do, we like to call it in the network. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. all right, your financial what, what problem do you want to solve yeah. now? And we've got a fund to actually. Yeah, find that out brilliant. so that that's the the twofold we're doing with that so 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 far we've built out a lot of the curriculum and resources kind of from a btc and accounting perspective because we have a really good accountant on our team as well um but we want to get more and more people and young people mm. with their, their ideas into the network mm, as that's well that's really good that's really great i love that all of that is really useful because I think the idea, I mean, there's two ways, right? I mean, there's stuff that we just want to play with and have fun and that's really good. Minecraft, go for it. <laughs> and heaps <laughs> of learning in that. But there are also what are the real use cases for some of this and how does it, can it demonstrate these um, ability to, yeah, change the way people learn or accelerate the way people are learning or change the way that we're engaging with the planet you know, every single mm-hmm. day, you know, this is the kind of, you know, and this is why, you know, I, I listen to other podcasts as well about, you know, Peter Diamondis and that whole crew on Moonshots and SU. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's just so much chatter about who's going to make the big bucks out of what. And I think that that is probably the most uninspiring thing right now for most people in the mm-hmm. world is who's going to make the most money out of something. <laughs> Um, yeah. And who cares? You know exactly. <laughs> who cares when we've got existential issues that we need to all be kind of really putting our shoulders to the wheel around to create yeah. happy and thriving and healthy environments for us to live in and and then we, and you know and play in and relate in and grow up in. So I think this is the kind of really big question, and it's come off the back of all of the social media that, you know, social media has been incredible and also not credible. (laughs) And, you know, we've had, we've got, I think the big issue, the pressing issue on everybody's minds is, will we learn from all of these use cases on all these different ways of all the technology that's been created? And will we use this learning in, as we enter the next wave you know the next horizon of things like bitcoin and nfts all the whole the whole environment that yeah well and I, th- I think sort of pursuing open source technology specifically and and teaching that is kind of the way to go yeah. and i think open source philosophies yes. for everything yes so it's yeah like like what powerful. you've what you've what you've done in the past really like that's 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 that, i think that's been like really a jump off point and like even the new york order was like a real spark for me because i'm like yes this is what we need to do basically for everything um and bring that into education all right switching gears a little bit (laughs) um so um do before we get into bitcoin i know we haven't got much time left Mm -hmm. it's been an hour already sorry for taking up so much time. (laughs) that's crazy (laughs) um so before we get into bitcoin the 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 question that i'd like to sort of ask everybody is like did you question money um, I guess I usually ask Bitcoin is before you heard about Bitcoin, but when, when was the first time you questioned money and what it is and, and where it comes from? If you have. <laughs> oh, always, 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 always. Um, so, you know, there's three currencies that work in the world, money, love, and power. Um, and so I grew up in the currency, I would say of love. So I grew up, you know, my parents helped set up Lifeline in Australia. They were very community oriented people. They were conservationists before anybody was a conservationist. I was hugging trees at, you know, two. So, um, <laughs> so I grew up in a ve- in a very different environment, which was which is about social justice and how do you ensure that, you know, the world is a is a place that's inclusive and equal for everyone. And and of course, because of that, you have to know about how power works because you have to go and lobby or advocate for change and you have to get involved in policy. And so I did a heap of that as a very, very young person. Um, And then money came a lot later in my life because then I realized, wow, well, there's a lot of money 
from a lot of different sources, not actually only really from government because we pay taxes. And again, we happen to live in a country where we have actually a pretty healthy tax base and people do pay their taxes. And we as citizens, with our compulsory voting, actually make big decisions <laughs> about where our taxes go, which is incredible. Like it's that's what democracy is about, right? So we're very fortunate that we're in that environment. But I think money then, the sources of money and how money flows became super, super interesting to me um, when I was sort of maybe in my 20s because I was thinking, hang on, there's a lot of people that make money out of not doing very much, <laughs> but mostly from moving money around, which is mm. pretty interesting. So I'm over here working super, super, super hard, very long hours, very long days with people who are either, you know, financially stressed or stretched or don't have enough money to do what they want to do. But over here, there's these people sitting around in suits and they seem to be making a lot of money and going to very long lunches for like half a day. Um, <laughs> and I just saw very quickly that something very interesting about that, but which was probably wrong, what was wrong with it. But I also saw it as an opportunity to, um, what, what, what does it look like if you get access to that money to use it for different purposes? Um, and so I mm. guess inevitably I got involved with um, corporates and with business people and with the idea of philanthropy particularly and then impact investing which has become much more of a model today where you get a return on your investment so that you can recycle that money and just not give it away in one hit through philanthropy. So I very much got involved in all the three currencies of life as I call them, money, power and love. I like that. And, um, like that. Yeah. and money, yeah, money is incredibly interesting, particularly if it can be repurposed, redistributed, recycled. Um, and also if you can get, and as I said, you know, that simple example of giving money to kids at a very young age to do something quite specific and meaningful and to learn and become entrepreneurial through that um, is incredibly powerful. And I think I had, like many women as well, a really unhealthy relationship with money in the sense of, you know, relying on other people or or that very huge sense of insecurity because of money and relying on other people. Mm. Um, I used to run female entrepreneurship workshops um, with, with boot camps actually at FIA. That was one of the streams of work that we did and we always had a session on money. It always went for 10 times the amount of time it was meant to go for in the boot camp. Yeah, right. And everyone, the women, young women particularly were talking about, and I resonated with all of it was relationship with money in relation to relationships, in relationship to parents, in relation to, to children, it's just incredibly complex and complicated. Yeah, and it shouldn't be, right? It should be it should be probably the easiest and most simple thing um, that people interact with, and it should be fair. That's that's the difference. So I think the, the system that we've kind of grown up with and the, the legacy uh, financial system, it's not very fair. And even like the the tax system, like I, I, I prefer to pay more taxes if I could, mm. if I knew where they were going mm. and if I could see in real time where they were going. But we don't have that. We have a debt black hole which is like, uh, excuse me, we could build this tomorrow afternoon. Why Why are we not watching where this goes in real time on the blockchain? Like this this could be done, right? I want to fund that school. I want to fund this project. I don't want my money to go to that. But no, yeah. <laughs> we don't have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that's one aspect that's going to gonna change rapidly with this technology. And I think it's going to be it's going to be awesome once it does. Um, there's going to be a few fat cats like the people you mentioned that won't be happy, but that's... <laughs> That's all right. I think that's that's fair. Um, but that's that's really interesting with your with yeah, the conversations with uh, women specifically and and finance. They found a lot of anxiety around it, and yeah, wasn't wasn't something um, to pursue. Would you say? Well, like, no, that's, not that's something sort of the mindset. that a lot of people felt they had power over because of yes. a lot of socialization Powerless. over many, mm -hmm. many, many, you know, intergenerational socialization around women and money and, um, you know, and also lack of knowledge. Like, as you know, so much of this comes back to knowledge. You know, we now know mm -hmm. that actually in most developing economies and even in developed economies, if you give a woman a dollar, it is it is four times at least with it, it it benefits four people immediately but you get a kind of a 10x return so women they've done all the research men will go and spend money 
you know, at the races or at the pub or whatever, women will go and spend money <laughs> on children, on their children, and yep. get and there's yeah, an immediate right. reinvestment. Um, they won't yeah. spend it on themselves. The last thing they do is spend it on themselves. So that's why, you know, the first microfinance programs around the world, the money went directly into the women's pockets, directly to women. The biggest, those yeah. biggest, the ones that Muhammad Yunus set up, um, they were into women and women's collectives because the other thing was that women were much more collectivist. So they immediately pooled their money. So every week in any one of those sewing collectives in a small part of India, there would be a part of the money that would be put aside. So if anybody needed a new fridge or some school uniforms for their kids or some books, there was always this pool of money that they'd all put into that they could redistribute based on a kind of a collective view of what, what was needed. So women, you know, although women have this fear and barrier and have been actually excluded from the monetary system in many, many ways over, you know, thousands and thousands of years, actually they're the best um, distributors and redistributors and recyclers and best get the best mm. return on investment is with women. That's really interesting. So, yeah, like for the most part around the world, not so much Australia, I suppose, but other countries like India, it's it's permission based, would you say? Permission? Yeah. So you have to have permission oh, to be allowed to. to yeah, to have yeah. to get access to money. Yeah. But in our case, yeah, yeah. it's socialization, which can be just as damaging and just as powerful. Or the sense yep. that you're no good with money because you're a woman, you know, that was a very, very, very strong until very recently. That's been a yep. very strong messaging to generations and generations of women. So women entrepreneurs, because of that and because of the socialization, get, you know, like a, only one or two percent of the sort of funding that's available from VCs, for instance, for startups. It's the hurdles they have to jump through are much, much, much higher um, because of this socialization that men have also about women and money. Interesting. Well, I think that's where Bitcoin could definitely help. Like, so having maybe not even just in Australia, but across the world, I think I think that like because Bitcoin's permissionless, right? Like no one has to give you permission to plug exactly. into the network. It levels it's the for everybody field. <laughs> completely across the board. That's that's such a that's such a good point. I think going back to the, the twenty dollar boss idea, I think that would be such a cool project as like an international project mm. to do specifically with BTC. And so, so like you're, you're not even giving it to, to mums and dads or whatever, directly to the kids yeah. who want to participate mm. and go, what business do you want to start with this? Or what problem do you want to solve? Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of my, my thinking with yeah. the, the decentralized autonomous education system. That's, that's really cool. That's a lot, a lot to think about, Jen. <laughs> that's great. Um, so with that, do you own any Bitcoin? That's <laughs> that was the question I was leading up to. Just before I came on here, I'd signed up to Amber. Oh, wicked. <laughs> Good work. So Amber's a pretty cool tool. Um, I did own it's some a, it's Bitcoin a, early. You know how I said that there was some early, uh, we were some, we were early, early adopters, adopters about 2016, yeah. uh, maybe 17. I can't oh, nice. We put money and lost it all. Um, but, um, oh. <laughs> but, uh, and we put too much in and lost too much, but, um, the sort of family did, so it was fine. But, um, yeah, so. My daughter, which I'm very pleased with, is like the NFT specialist in the family, which is <laughs> cool, great cool. to my to that point about. She said, "I'm not going to be disempowered in this in in this in this system, in this financial awesome. system where which I have been in the last financial system, the 20th yep. century one." And so she has been all over it and got herself hugely educated, and um, I'm super Wicked. super happy about that. Um, but yeah, oh, I haven't awesome. had any Bitcoin for a while, but because of, um, because of you and talking about you, I thought I was going to get a bit of Amber and see what <laughs> Well, Am Amber's a pretty cool tool. It lets you add DCA, so yeah. dollar cost average. So you can do like five bucks a month yeah. if you want yeah. and set and forget it. Yeah, and it just that's does what, it I've, for that's you. what pretty, I've done. It's pretty oh, awesome. <laughs> that's really, did you use the code? Yeah. Oh, wicked. All right, you'll get eight bucks, I think, for free. So that's really good. Um, that's awesome with your daughter. So she's doing NFTs. Has she looked at um, stacks? I don't know, probably. Actually, I think she has, actually. I think she's, now that you say that, I definitely feel like she's talked, mentioned that and spoken about that. 
because they're pretty cool and they're, they're building like NFT infrastructure on top of Bitcoin yeah. specifically. So you've got competing stuff. So like Solana and Ethereum that are what's mm. called proof of stake. Mm. So when I was talking about that hash rate, they haven't got that. So there's no guarantee they'll be around for mm. the next couple of years, mm. whereas Bitcoin's guaranteed to be here until 2140. Mm. So we'll all be dead when <laughs> by that date. <laughs> 2140. But, uh, I think 2140, Ethereum might the... have been what we went in on early, maybe. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's, you were right. It looks, it looks very similar, mm. similar to Bitcoin. It has similar characteristics, mm. but it's it's not Bitcoin. I actually can't and remember that's, because that's... it was pre-pandemic and I can't remember anything pre <laughs> I know what you mean. BC, pre, before pre COVID, I can't remember. Staying in your house. What, yeah. that, what was that like before that? BC. Um, exactly. Well, that's so cool. So, yeah, so you're on the app. So, the next step for you would probably be a, a, like a hardware wallet. And that's that's basically to, to keep it secure offline. And then from there, building a node. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of learning materials that you can go along with. But um, if you want to jump on the score of Bitcoin, we've kind of got all those um, built out so you can, it's all free. You can just jump on and have a look. Mm. We are thinking of doing, um, in fact, what you just said with the 2017 cycle um, and losing money, what we were thinking, and I'll run this past you, what, what you think about it. So we're thinking of doing an open framework. Um, we're basically... The, there's a, like a four-year cycle. It's called the halvening. Mm -hmm. So basically at the end of four years, you have um, the difficulty rate for mining goes up. So that's when you see these crazy spikes in the price. Yes. It's about six months after. Yes. You'll see it go nuts. And then you, it's all in the news. The newspaper's like, we don't know why. Like, why is this happening again? <laughs> oh, my God. And then it's the worst thing in the world again, um, you know, a, a year later sort of thing. And it's happened again and again and again. You can just follow the trend and watch it go on up, up and down with that. So the the halving it is is basically um, yeah every four years ish. So you think of the blockchain as like a big clock. So what I'm thinking is of doing a, a four year course. Ooh. So to run people through that a whole cycle. cycle. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So instead of them sort of panic selling. And going, oh no, the market, the sky's falling because mm. they don't have the knowledge from, mm. from before. So, you know, like kind of holding their hand mm. and saying, no, it's all right, guys, you can learn as you go mm. through through this cycle. So, we've got, I think it's about two years out now, or wow, just under. Amazing. Till the next one. So, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to launch that as well, but I've got too many things That's going cool. on. That's cool. That's really good, though. <laughs> I think the learning, yeah, you've got so many things. I think the learning is so important, though. Like, it's really, really, really important, the education piece, as much as possible. Um, I think it's really good. I think it's great. For everything. Because everyone's, yeah, for, well, uh, I know my daughter's sort of done self, you know, directed learning on this. I don't know what else she's doing. Like, I don't know if she's in any clubs or whatever, but... I feel like she did a lot of self-directed learning and maybe some short courses, but, you know, how would you know really what you were, yeah, learning? Getting into, well, that's getting it. Into, yeah, yeah okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, that, the same same for me for the most part for mm. all, all this sort of stuff. So my background's network engineering, so mm. it's obviously the two sort of marry up, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, very well for you. But for the <laughs> most part, like, it's all just... Yeah, for the it's normal all just, hunter just, as well. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot really of stuff complex. to learn. It's a lot to know. Um, and it, and is, it will be, is. and again, that's why I'm, I'm super keen that, yeah, as soon as the youngest that children and young people can be just exploring these things with no risk, you know, is going to be the most interesting for them. Yeah, yeah, it's the risk aspect, I suppose. I think the, the, the thing is to sort of separate out a crypto and that's like all these thousands of mm. things that kind of look like Bitcoin mm. and Bitcoin. Mm. Um, not to say they're not building fun, interesting, cool things mm. like on the and I, I think of them as like test nets. Yes. So it's like, oh, this is great. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Develop that. Don't put all your money into that because that's that's high risk. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the Bitcoin network, as as hopefully you've kind of learned through this podcast is yeah. um, going to be around for a very long time yeah. and the hash rate's never been hacked. Like it's, mm. it's really risk-free mm. in terms of not price, mm. but in terms of security yeah. specifically yeah. as two very different things. Mm. But um, 
That's great. Thanks so much for doing this, Jen. This has been awesome. It's been so interesting. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. Oh, that's awesome. I've got so awesome. much more to learn on all these new the new currencies. I'm gonna to have to add I'm gonna to have to add to my currencies of life. I'm gonna to have to say, you know, love, power and Bitcoin instead of yeah. money. <laughs> I love that. The three I love currencies that for sure. at work in the world. Um anyway, it's what, been I think great. we'll I think I think we'll have to look at like I'm super excited for that future school project as well. So yeah. if there's any way that I can help support that Thank you. with the BTC network or not, like just, just sing out. Yeah. Cause I think it's, it's really, really important yeah. for uh, all of Victoria. Really? Like we need it. Yeah. Desperately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the world, or all of Australia the world really needs it as well. The world needs yeah. it. Absolutely. Now what, what's the best places for people to find you? Um, uh, just like on your... LinkedIn and stuff like LinkedIn? that. Yeah. yeah. Twitter. <laughs> although I may be, I may leave the Twitterverse soon. I don't know. Mastodon. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just literally, I'm just literally yeah. thinking about it. Um, Fair enough. But yeah, I'm pretty low key actually. I'm not, I don't try to be on too many platforms these days. I'm very easily distracted. And so I just have to manage <laughs> yes. my distractions. Fair enough. LinkedIn's probably the spot for that. Yeah, it's very, it's very, you know, if I get near TikTok, Business. like whole weeks of my life can disappear without me knowing. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So oh, it's, all, it's all good. Great to chat. Really oh, so, glad yeah, we got we'll, to catch we'll up We'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, we'll have to do another one. I want to get Peter on yeah, for, do for that. as well. So yeah, maybe, that definitely. Maybe we could, I can get you both on. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> that would be, we would love that. <laughs> awesome awesome thanks again jen 